Chapter 14, the United States Civil War. By the end of 1860, the fraying cords that had bound the Union had snapped. The second party system had collapsed, replaced by a system that accentuated rather than muted regional controversies. The federal government was no longer a remote, unthreatening presence for most Americans. The need to resolve the status of the territories had made it necessary for Washington to deal directly with sectional issues. In short, the 1860 election precipitated the most terrible conflict in United States history. As soon as news of Abraham Lincoln's election reached the South, militant leaders began to demand an end to the Union. South Carolina, along the hotbed of Southern separatism, issued its Declaration of the Immediate Causes. While Buchanan still held the presidency, this is before Lincoln was even inaugurated, just a month or month and a half later. Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas, up to seven states, including South Carolina, uh, seceded within a matter of weeks from the United States. Delegates from the seceding states met in Montgomery, Alabama, and formed a new country, the Confederate States of America, CSA, Confederate States of America. They seized all federal property within their boundaries, claiming it as their own, and attempted to take Fort Sumter, an offshore military installation, before Lincoln assumed office. But a Congressional Committee of 13 failed to advance a, reconcil a reconciliatory Crittenden Compromise, the Committee of 13 and their Crittenden Compromise. The new president, Lincoln, warned that secession was insurrectionary and that the government would hold, occupy, and possess all federal property in the seceding states. The Confederates promptly shelled Fort Sumter for two days and the war had begun. After the fight at Fort Sumter, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina joined the seceding states. 11 states had now seceded. The most important material advantages for the war uh, undeniably lied with the North. The South had no ability to manufacture even its own weapons and munitions. The North had much better transportation system and the Confederate railroads were crumbling by 1864. Conversely, the Southern armies had the advantage of fighting on their own turf largely, and Northern armies had to deal with hostile locals across the South or running military communications back and forth to Washington, DC. The commitment of the white population to the Confederate cause was clear and firm. In the North, opinion was more divided. There are still Northern Democrats and support remained shaky until Lincoln's death. A major Southern victory at any one of several critical moments might've actually proved decisive in breaking the Union's will to continue the fight in addition, the South's economic ties to England and French textile industries inclined global leaders of all sorts to favor the Confederate cause, <clears throat> and the South hoped that one or both nations might eventually join the war on their behalf. After most of the slave states had seceded from the Union, the Republican Party enjoyed, obviously, an unprecedented level of control over the federal government. Seceding states were no longer sending their Democratic representatives to Congress any longer. They were no longer a part of the United States, they claimed. During the war, Republicans enacted an aggressively nationalistic program to promote economic development in Northern states and in Western territories. The Homestead Act permitted any man to purchase 160 acres of frontier land out West after living on it and developing it for a period of five years. The Morrill Act transferred public land to state government, which they sold to help uh, launch public universities and colleges, so-called land grant institutions. You still hear the expression. The federal government also spurred completion of a transcontinental railroad finally, the two halves of which met at Promontory Point, Utah. With virtually no opposition, Republicans authorized a new national banking system that removed most of the uncertainty uh, surrounding the nation's currency. The North funded their war by levying taxes, selling paper currency, but mostly by borrowing from banks and even from ordinary citizens with bonds. With only 16,000 troops in the army before the war, the Union was forced to raise its army from scratch. The bulk of the fighting would have to be done by volunteers organized by state militias. Congress quickly authorized the enlistment of 500,000 volunteers for three-year terms. By March of 1863, with enthusiasm for the war all but tapped out across the North, Congress was forced to pass a military draft to beef up its ranks. Virtually all young adult males were eligible to be conscripted. This is one of the conscription acts. The South will do this too. Although a man could escape service by hiring someone to go in his place or by paying the government a $300 fine. To many who were accustomed to a remote national government in DC, conscription was strange and threatening. Opposition to the draft was widespread, particularly to those opposed to the war. Some of the draft riots that grew in response to conscription turned violent as they did across the North in 1863. 
In New York City, rioters turned their anger on African Americans living in the city, burning black homes, lynching free blacks, and even targeting an orphanage for black children. This infamous New York City draft riot, or riots, occurred over many days. Started officially as an effort uh, to resist this rich man's war, but a poor man's fight. Fears of what freed slave labor might mean for white labor marked and stoked animosity and fear across the city and across much of the North. Only the arrival of federal troops direct from the Battle, battle of Gettysburg were able to halt days of widespread insurrection in New York City. Put yourself in the shoes of um, like a, maybe a poor white family in this era in the North. You've watched the war rage for years. You chose not to participate. Now the federal government's going to force you to fight on behalf of African-American slaves and potentially die for the cause. It was not an easy argument for the North to win, particularly because your wealthy neighbors could simply just pay their way out of it. President Abraham Lincoln arrived in Washington, D.C. with a thorough understanding of his own weaknesses. He assembled a cabinet representing every faction within the Republican Party and every segment of Northern opinion, including those opposed to the war. He boldly used his war power, sometimes ignoring constitutional limits on his power. For instance, he never secured a formal declaration of war against the South, claiming that the conflict was a domestic insurrection, not a war. He increased the size of the U.S. Army, unilaterally proclaimed a naval blockade on the South, and even had Northern newspaper editors critical of the Union cause temporarily imprisoned. Lincoln's greatest challenge was a widespread opposition to the war in pockets of the North, mobilized by so-called peace Democrats, the Doe Faces, sometimes called Copperheads. Lincoln ordered military arrest of civilian deserters and suspended the right of habeas corpus to those critical of draft enlistments. By 1864, the North was in political turmoil and Democrats within the Union nominated George B. McClellan, a celebrated former Union general under Lincoln on an anti-war ticket that called for a truce with the South. For a time, Lincoln's prospects at re-election in 1864 seemed quite dim. At a crucial moment though, Union military victories, particularly the, ca particularly the capture of Atlanta, rejuvenated Northern morale and boosted Republican party prospects. And Lincoln won re-election comfortably with a 212 to 21 electoral college vote margin. Throughout Lincoln's time as president then, Republicans disagreed sharply with one another on the question of slavery. So-called radical Republicans wanted to use the war to abolish slavery immediately, immediately and completely. They inherited the legacy of the abolitionists. While conservative Republicans, those older Whigs, those sympathetic to Northern Democrats, favored a more cautious approach, in part to placate the slave states that remained, however precariously, within the Union. Not every slave state joined the Confederate States of America. Some did not secede from the United States. Regardless, momentum began to gather behind emancipation or the freeing of some slaves early in the war. In 1861, Congress passed the First Confiscation Act, First Confiscation Act, which declared that all slaves used in support of the Confederate Army, sometimes called contrabands, would be considered free men during the conflict by the North. A second Confiscation Act in 1862 declared the, uh, free the slaves of persons supporting the insurrection and also authorized the president to employ African Americans as Northern soldiers. As the war progressed, many in the North began to accept emancipation as a central aim of the war. Many feared that no smaller accomplishment could justify the enormous blood sacrifices the struggle requ uh, required. As a result, the radicals gained influence within the party and Lincoln worked to champion their cause over time. After the Union victory at Antietam, the president announced his intention to use his war powers to issue an executive order, a presidential order, to free all slaves within the Confederacy, Antietam. On the first day of 1863, January 1st, Lincoln formally signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which declared forever free all slaves residing within the seceding states. Notably, the proclamation did not free the slaves still residing in Union slave states, Tennessee, West Virginia, Louisiana. And though it had no immediate impact on those slaves in the South, it didn't actually do anything in that moment. The document, along with Lincoln's Gettysburg Address later that year, irrevocably established that the war was being fought to both preserve the United States as a union and to free African slaves. And as federal armies came to occupy much of the American South, the proclamation would become a practical reality. 186,000 emancipated blacks eventually served as soldiers, sailors, and laborers in union forces. Yet early in the war, African Americans were largely excluded from military service. Most black male soldiers were assigned to menial tasks behind the enemy lines, were paid significantly less than their white counterparts, and when captured, were often executed brutally by their Confederate soldiers. 
The war mobilized women into unfamiliar roles outside the home and made them a dominant force in the field of nursing. Other women came to see war as an opportunity to win support for their own goals. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony worked during the Civil War for the abolition of slavery and for women's suffrage. The Constitution written by the seceding Confederate States of America was almost identical to the Constitution of the United States that you and I know, uh, well know, but few significant differences emerged at the writing. The document explicitly acknowledged the sovereignty of individual states, it sanctioned slavery, and made its abolition practically impossible. A spirit of Confederate nationalism now swept through the South. Confederate nationalism hardening into a single idea among the secessionists that sought to justify their cause. Quote, the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery is his natural and normal condition. Jefferson Davis of Mississippi was named the provisional president at the Constitutional Convention for the CSA. He was later elected to a six year term. Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy. Although there were no formal political parties within the Confederacy, states' rights quickly became a cult of sorts among white Southerners, which made virtually all efforts to exert national authority during this war effort nearly impossible. States' rights enthusiasts objected to uh, conscription and restricted all of Davis's bold efforts to try to even win this war. Some Confederate governors even tried to keep their own troops separate from the other armies, the state armies of the Confederacy. They wanted to be their own army, the states did. States' rights sentiment was a significant handicap for the Confederacy. But the South still took steps in the direction of centralization, like the North did, including seizing control over federal railroads, private property, impressing slaves of owners to work as laborers on military projects, and permitting soldiers to feed themselves by seizing Southern crops from farms in their path, the so-called food draft. To pay for their war effort, the Confederacy enacted an income tax, which only raised 1% of the new government's total income. Borrowing was not much more successful for the Confederacy, even in European markets, where they attempted to use cotton as leverage. The Confederacy then was forced to pay for its war through its unstable system of selling paper currency. We're going to see an attempts at income tax in the, in the North and South and an attempt to issue paper dollars as a way to finance the war. By 1864, the Confederacy had issued one and a half billion dollars in this new paper money, resulting in disastrous inflation across the South. A five cent loaf of bread cost nine cents by the, by the end of the war in the North which also suffered some inflation. In the South, that same loaf of, loaf of bread would have cost $4.50 in this new Confederate money. As the war dragged on, the Southern economy fell into chaos and the government responded by printing more and more worthless Confederate dollars. Like the United States, the Confederate States of America en enacted a conscription act, which subjected all white males between the ages of 18 and 35 to military service for a period of three years. Everyone ought to serve. Enthusiasm for the war was strong enough to support conscription for a time. But by 1864, the Confederate Army faced a critical manpower shortage. In a frantic final attempt to raise men for its armies, the Confederacy, uh, the Confederate Congress authorized a conscription of 300,000 slaves to do the fighting on behalf of the Confederacy. But the war ended before the Confederate state government could actually uh, attempt this incongruous experiment. The war made the economies of the North hum as the production of goods increased to meet wartime demand. In the South, economic output declined by more than one third. Fighting itself wrecked havoc on the Southern landscape, destroying farmland, destroying towns, cities, and tearing up railroad lines. Food and supply shortages, dollar inflation, and the carnage of war created instability across Southern society. The war forced people across the South to question the prevailing assumption that females were not suited for the public sphere. Remember that old cult culture of honor on the plantation, since many women had to perform non-traditional, non-domestic tasks during the conflict now with men on, on the front lines. The war in general decimated the Southern male population across the Confederacy. After all of the war dead were counted, women significantly outnumbered men across the Southern states at the end of the war. As a result, a large number of unmarried or widowed women had no choice but to find employment after the war. Militarily, Lincoln understood that to resecure the Union, he needed to destroy the Confederate armies, and not merely occupy Southern territory. He struggled, though, to find a general who shared his point of view. The promotion of McClellan, the earlier promotion of McClellan, was a disappointment for Lincoln early in the war. And Lincoln's handling of the war effort often faced scrutiny from the Committee on the Conduct of War, a joint investigative committee comprised by members of Congress. It wasn't until March of 1864 that Lincoln found a general he trusted to command his war effort. Ulysses S. Grant, that soldier from Galena, Illinois, Ulysses S. Grant, shared Lincoln's belief in unremitting combat. In the South, President Jefferson Davis controlled all aspects of Confederate military strategy throughout the war. 
Interestingly, officers for both militaries were typically trained at West Point or at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. The Northern Blockade kept ocean-going ships out of Confederate ports, uh, and the North's naval advantages was used to great effect on the lakes and rivers of the Western theater of the war, where the South had no significant navy of its own. Diplomacy between the two sides also proved a decisive factor in who would win this war. At the beginning of the conflict, sympathies of the ruling class in England and France lay largely with the Confederacy, partly because the nations imported so much Southern cotton. They were also eager to see a weaker United States Union, which had become an increasingly powerful rival to Europe in the terms of world commerce. The peoples of England and France, though, favored the North, especially the English anti-slavery movement. In the end, no European nation offered real diplomatic recognition to the Confederate States of America, let alone intervene in the conflict. No nation wanted to antagonize the United States unless a Confederate victory seemed assured. Much of what happened on the battlefields of the Civil War was a result of new technologies that transformed the nature of armed combat. Advances in iron and steel technology, the introduction of the repeating pistol by Samuel Colt and the repeating rifle by Oliver Winchester in 1860 and the improvement of cannons and artillery all served to make the Civil War the first modern high casualty American conflict, particularly the repeating rifle. It's now impossibly deadly to fight battles as they had been fought for centuries. Soldiers quickly learned that the proper position for combat was to stay low and to find cover against these new uh, weapons. In the past, soldiers had marched in formations and fired volleys of low accuracy artillery at one another. For the first time in global history, infantry did not fight in formation and the battlefield became a much more chaotic place with festering wounds, infections, and battlefield illnesses, equally fatal forces to the flurry of flying lead. The deadliness of these new weapons forced armies to spend a great deal of time building fortifications and trenches to protect themselves. Hot air balloons, ironclad ships, torpedoes, submarine technology, machine guns, all made fleeting appearances in the 1860s, suggesting dramatic changes would soon overtake the art of warfare as we head into the 20th century. Critical to the progression of the war, however, were two relatively new technologies, the railroad and the telegraph. The railroad was particularly important as it allowed for the rapid mobilization of tens of thousands of soldiers and tons of supplies that they required. Commanders organized their campaigns around the location of the rails, and the concentrating quality of rail travel encouraged commanders to organize great battles with large armies rather than fight smaller engagements. Telegraph wires were strung up along rail routes to troop encampments, allowing field commanders to stay in close contact with one another during massive battles and kept them in connection with Washington, D.C. as well. In absence of direct intervention by the European powers and with a clear understanding of the uniqueness of the conflict, the two contestants were left to resolve the conflict through sheer bloodshed. They did so over the course of four years of brutal combat. More than 618,000 American men died as a result of direct conflict, more than the totals of World War I and World War II combined. I will not lecture you on an exhaustive narrative of the ebb and flow of the war's bloody battles, but I will highlight important turning points in the conflict. In the opening clashes of the Civil War, after the Southern states had seceded, the Union Army suffered high-profile losses on the Virginian front, as opposition to the war gained steam on the home front in the North. The two-day Battle of Shiloh in Tennessee saw approximately 23,000 casualties, a number that exceeded casualties from all of the United States' previous wars combined. Out West, the Union Army seized the city of New Orleans and controlled the minor Western theater of the war by 1862. The United States Union Army liberated uh, the anti-secession mountain people of Virginia who broke off to form West Virginia. Back East, however, uh, Union General George B. McClellan refused to advance as quickly as Lincoln wanted, and the Confederacy won most of the conflicts leading up to General Grant's siege of Vicksburg in 1863. Vicksburg. At the bloody three-day Battle of Gettysburg, General Pickett's heroic but ill-fated charge on the northern position would serve as the high water mark for the advance of the Confederate Army. General Robert E. Lee's retreat at Gettysburg was a turning point in the, in the Civil War, and the weakened Confederate forces were never again able to threaten Northern territory again. By 1864, Lincoln's new general, General Ulysses S. Grant, had become general in chief of all Union armies, and he pursued Lincoln's troops all across the South. Under Grant's direction, William Tecumseh Sherman, William T. Sherman, implemented a policy well, that would be called total war at Lincoln's behest. Sherman took Atlanta, which is a boost to the Northern effort. And then he marched to the sea, 
famous expression, cutting a 60 mile wide swath of desolation across Georgia, depriving the Confederates of materials and transportation lines, but more importantly, breaking the will of the Southern people themselves by burning towns and plantations along the route. Sherman took Savannah, Georgia, and then he moved northward until he hit North Carolina, virtually unopposed along the entire route of destruction. Grant's own Army of the Potomac, Grant's Army of the Potomac, worked tirelessly to take Richmond, Virginia, and then the Southern capital. Jefferson Davis and others set fire to their city as they fled, and Lincoln himself was present and his Union forces took the seat of the Confederacy. Lee's army, down to just 25,000 men, moved west, but arranged to meet General Grant in Appomattox, Virginia, where on April 9th, Lee surrendered what was left of his forces. The other Confederate army uh, general surrendered to Sherman nine days later. Jefferson Davis was soon captured in Georgia, and the few diehards who continued to fight across the American South quickly collapsed. The Confederacy had run out of energy, and the two war-weary peoples now faced an unhappy reunion. The American Civil War, the bloodiest in the nation's history, resulted in over 750,000 total deaths. The war touched the lives of nearly every American person as military mobilization reached levels never before seen or since. Most Northern soldiers went to war to preserve their union, but the war ultimately transformed itself into a bloody struggle to eradicate slavery from the American continent. African Americans, both enslaved and free, pressed the issue of emancipation and nurtured this transformation. Simultaneously, women thrust themselves into critical wartime roles while navigating a world without as many men of military age any longer. Many had died. That the vast death and destruction of the Civil War seems unimaginable to us today speaks to the strength of the issues of freedom and justice it settled. In 1865, Congress approved and the states ratified the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. All of the slave states that are going to rejoin the Union will have to ratify this amendment. This abolished slavery in all parts of the United States forever. After more than two centuries, the infernal institution that had been allowed to survive the revolution had finally ceased on American soil.